Welcome to the study of God's Word, recorded live from Calvary Chapel in Aurora, Colorado. To learn more about the many resources available through Abounding Grace Media, visit us online at calvaryaurora.org or download our free app on all platforms. And now, let's open our Bibles and study God's Word. Amen. Please turn to Matthew chapter 14 in your Bibles. And we're going to be looking at the account of what happened between Jesus and his disciples right after the feeding of the 5,000. All four Gospels deal with the feeding of the 5,000, but three of them, Matthew, Mark, and John, deal with this incident that took place with Jesus walking on the water. And so as we look at this, we find that there's some interesting things that are taking place here that I think have application even to us today, even though we're 2,000 some years later. Because Jesus is still alive, isn't he? He's at the right hand of God. He's alive, never to die again. He makes intercession for us daily. And so where we are here is about two and a half years into Jesus' ministry. He's coming to the the greatest point of his popularity in the area of Israel. And there's a big challenge coming up. 5,000 men plus women and children had just been fed with a kid's happy meal. Five loaves and two fish. And the disciples took the meager amount they had. They gave it to Jesus because he asked for it. And he took and multiplied it and fed all these people. The disciples were involved in service. They had to go and and get the crowd settled in groups of 50. And that must have been a project all its own. And then they were the distributors. They weren't the manufacturers, were they? They were the distributors. Jesus was the manufacturer. And by the way, that still is the case. When God asks us to serve him, he asks us just to be a distributor of what he gives to us. Lord, would you fill me with your love because I cannot manufacture your love. But you've called me to distribute your love. You've called me to be others oriented. You've called me to bless other people. But I need a filling from you because it has to come from you. I can't make this up. I can't create this on my own. And so the disciples distributed the food to the 5,000. And it was a wonderful experience. Plus, Jesus said at the end, Now go and gather the leftovers so that nothing is lost. And we know that they gathered 12 baskets of leftovers true finger food because they were leftovers. The people had filled themselves to the full and there was more than enough. And all of a sudden, through all of their service, God had provided each of the disciples a basket, their own basket of finger foods. A great time. But we find out in this text that Jesus quickly sent them away because he himself wanted to dismiss the crowd. Well, it was a a great time. It was toward the evening. It was such a miracle that the disciples must have been blown away. And why can't I just stay and enjoy this? And Jesus is is saying, leave, go, go. Because this is where we pick it up in verse 22. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now when evening came, he was alone there. We know from the Gospel of John in his record of the feeding of the 5,000, there's a very important verse at the very end. John writes his gospel at the end of his life, toward the end of the first century, and he has this perspective of looking back as the Holy Spirit is bringing all those things to remembrance. And here's what he writes in John 6, 15. 
When, therefore, when Jesus perceived that they, the multitude, were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he departed again to the mountain by himself alone. So there's something going on with the crowds. They are so excited. They are so, you know, just energized that they want it. This is the Messiah. Let's make him king. Let's crush the Romans. Because that's what they were told their whole life in going to synagogue and Sabbath school. Because the scriptures testified of Jesus ruling and reigning. But they missed the fact of the essential part of him suffering and dying to pay for sin and conquer sin and death. So why did Jesus send the disciples away so so soon? And actually, in verse 22, it says, immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat. And another translation says, he constrained them to get into the boat and to go. I think it's um, Mark's gospel that says they were to go over to Bethsaida about three or four miles away. Nothing for seasoned fishermen to do that. But why did Jesus not get them involved? I, th- I, I think personally, it's to remove them from the temptation to get caught up in the expectation of the crowds. And really, the disciples had grown up with that same expectation. Judas was part of it. He was part of the group that fed the 5,000. He was part of those that were in the boat. But because he had his own agenda, he didn't allow the truth of who the Lord was to settle into his heart. Isn't it amazing that our agendas and our plans and our way of thinking can become so solid that we won't allow the word of God to even penetrate our hearts. That seed sown on the hard ground or even upon stony ground. Sometimes the Lord removes us from situations that he knows are too tempting for us. I I believe that with all my heart. When you've got a plan and you think, man, this is the best, this is going to be great. And then all of a sudden the door closes and the opportunity is missed and you're going, what? Lord, I prayed for this and it just seemed like it was so right. And then the door closes. Just maybe, rather than thinking that God is being mean, that he's protecting you from something you don't even see or recognize. The Lord knows us individually, and he knows what things would be too strong of a temptation for us. And he has the right, as our Lord and Savior, to remove us from the situation. We read in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it or endure it. And sometimes we just have to rethink and saying, you know, Lord, I acknowledged you in all my ways and you promised to direct my paths. And if you close the door, I want to say by faith, thank you, because you're smarter than me. You know, when we were serving in the UK and I was pastoring the church, and after I had my heart attack, uh, because pastoring in the UK will, will create that. Uh, uh, the Lord started this whole transition process, which we weren't ready to do. And some of you have heard this story before. We wanted to stay two more years. Even after I'd had the heart attack, when I get stronger and better, then we can go travel around. We can do all this. And the Lord just says, no, you're moving back. And it was very clear. And, and, you know, I kind of I fought with it a bit. My wife fought with it a bit. And then finally, it's like, checkmate, game's over. You're, you're moving back. Well, little did I know that six months later, COVID would hit. And everything would shut down. 
and we would have been stuck in the UK, in our house, when does it, we couldn't get out. We couldn't travel around and help out other pastors like our calling was. We'd just been stuck for a long time. And the Lord didn't say why. And there's also the issue of, of the house that you were going to rent out. If there's an issue with the, the COVID and they can't make the payment, you can't evict them. And so all the plans that we had, that's, that just made sense. The Lord is going, no, I want you to do this instead, constraining us <laughs> to move out and to come back here. I thank the Lord that he's more smart than me because I'm pretty dumb, actually, looking back over the years. But you know what? As you look back on your life and see all the failures, you need to understand God does not look at you through your failures. God looks at you through what he wants to do in you. And failure is something that he uses as part of his mosaic in your life. He wants to take and use those things. At least be a good student. You're not perfect. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to just do stupid things. But guess what? God is sovereign, and he's going to work in your life, and, and he has that ability to turn it around. I like how the Lord works with us Sometimes not telling us, often not telling us why, but just trust me. Can you trust the Lord with your life right now? Some of you, some of you young people have been asking the Lord, please bring me the one I'm supposed to marry. My clock is ticking. Why isn't it happening? And then in your mind, you're thinking, I'm going to force it. I am going to go, I'm not, I got to find that right one. And you're looking for the, the special soulmate. You know, unless the Lord sets it up, you can set yourself up with some big heartache. Yeah, but I'm so afraid I'll be left alone. That's where you have to ask the Lord to wash your heart and give him, give you his perspective. I'm just telling you, I've counseled so many. You know what's interesting, and this is not in my notes, but it's interesting that when God created Adam and Eve and he brought Eve into the picture, he didn't ask Adam to go on a safari to go find Eve. He brought Eve to Adam. And Adam was doing what God had set before him to do. And so in the process of doing his service and ministry to the Lord, God brought his spouse to him. And I just think there's an interesting pattern there. That rather than hunting and doing a safari, trying to find your perfect spouse, that the Lord just wants you to keep your eyes on him and do what he sets before you and he'll work it out because he knows your heart. Yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but. Well, wait, yeah, but, yeah, but. <laughs> you know, just... Just let the Lord take care of it. That must be for somebody here or somebody listening online because it's not on my notes. And let's keep on going. Verse 24. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, it's a ghost. And they cried out in fear. These are grown men. They cried out in fear. But immediately, Jesus spoke to them, saying, be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. First thing, Jesus went up on the mountain alone to pray. Do you ever consider that after a success, after a victory in your life, that it's an important time to spend time alone with the Lord? Why? For perspective. Because you realize your flesh is just right there, ready to take the credit. If something good happens, you're right there saying, I knew that. I could handle that. I knew what I was doing all along. No, you need to get some perspective. Because, buddy, you are ready to mess up the whole thing. 
And he intervened. It's so important, even after a victory or after a success, to block out time with the Lord and get perspective again of who's really in charge and to thank him for the help because he was involved in ways we won't see until we get to heaven. And Jesus, after that time of, of that, uh, actually it was the 18th miracle, um, recorded miracle, and the disciples had seen all that. But Jesus had to get away with the Father after that time of success. So the disciples get in the boat in the evening, and they make their casual three or four mile row over to Bethsaida. And then the storm hits. And the wind comes down through those northern mountains, through those, there's a particular valley there in the, more, in the northern part of Galilee, north of the Sea of Galilee, and it, it changes the velocity of the wind. Similar to if you're breathing through your mouth with an open mouth, you know, there's a particular pressure. But when you purse your lips, then all of a sudden it's much stronger. And so when this wind comes down through that valley, it pushes and, and increases the velocity, making it so strong that it can pull a vessel, push the vessel clear out into the middle of the Sea of Galilee. And so here they are rowing. I mean, there's 12 of them, 12 of them in the boat with the baskets. I mean, they got 12 baskets, probably stacked up, six, maybe six high. And, and they're just going like, dude, we've got, lunch, we've got dinner coming. So let's go and just, you know, have some um, grub hub, you know. And so they, uh, and all of a sudden they get pushed out and they are rowing and rowing and rowing. Actually, Mark chapter 6, verse 48 gives us a clue. It says, when he, Jesus, saw them straining at rowing, for the wind was against them, now about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea and would have passed by them. How did Jesus see them? If they were three or four miles out and he's on the mountain and it's a storm because he has that ability to see beyond the physical. You know, in your storm right now, the storm of your life, Jesus sees you. He knows what you're going through. He knows how long it's been. But he sees you. I believe that with all my heart. So often we're just, we just think we're alone in the midst of the storm and the Lord is off on top of the mountain. And you're all by yourself. And as hard as you try, you can't get out of your situation. And you're at the end of yourself. You're at the end of your resources. You're at the end of your strength. You're at the end of your wits. Where's the Lord? You ever said that? I have. I have to, I have to admit it. He knows it. But he doesn't give up on me because I have my season of doubt. Because he perseveres with me. By the way, how windy was it up on the mountain? Now think of it. It's just like the enemy, Satan, to disrupt, to disrupt Jesus praying with the Father as well as really put the disciples in terror. And so he persevered through the storm in his praying. And the disciples were straining at rowing. And then it says that of the fourth watch of the night he came to them. You know, that's three o'clock in the morning. Uh, there's four Roman watches. There's 6 p.m., 9 p.m., midnight, and 3 a.m. How long were they rowing? Well, if they were released in the evening, as it says in the Gospel of John, it could have been at least nine hours of rowing. How tired were they? They were totally at the end of themselves. Nine hours getting no headway over a simple three or four mile row. What happened? Were they in disobedience? No, they were doing what Jesus said. Sometimes, even when we obey the Lord in his word, a storm can happen to us in our life. And we don't always, you shouldn't always just think, what have I done wrong to make this happen? Everything collapsed. Wait a second. 
Sometimes storms happen when you're obeying the Lord. And sometimes he doesn't show up right away. Gosh, fourth watch of the night, it's dark. And they're cold and they're wet and they can't see. You know, their little lantern isn't going to give them much. Where's Jesus? And then when he shows up like just, you know, here's this glow. And then it's like he's going to pass by them. So you're in the midst of a storm. Where's Jesus? All of a sudden he shows up and he goes to some, somebody else. You're asking the Lord, please break through to my life. Please, please take care of this. And he goes and helps somebody else out. And it's like, what? Wait a minute, Lord, where are you? And you know, they, they were at the end of themselves. They weren't thinking so clearly. And they're seeing this glow. By the way, the glow wasn't so Jesus could see where he needed to go. The glow was for their sakes to see him. And sometimes we're so wrapped up in our storm, we don't even see the Lord right there. Because he promised never to leave us, nor forsake us. The Lord's not forsaking us when he decides to help somebody else and not us immediately. Because we are called to walk by faith, aren't we? Not by sight. Well, <laughs> I have to say that I haven't been always successful. The storms that have happened in our life, I haven't been a superman of faith. Sometimes all I could say is, Lord, have mercy. Please have mercy. I remember having uh, serious bouts with vertigo over in the UK. So much so that I lost my driver's license in the UK. And there was one time that it, it hit me so bad. I was, I was driving our van. You know, it's the kind of van you, you're driving on the right side. And then you have to shift with your left hand. And so you have to get used to that. And my wife wasn't ready to do that. While I was driving, all of a sudden I get hit with vertigo while I'm driving and everything's starting to spin and I'm thinking okay if I can just make it home if I can just make it home and then all of a sudden I'm going to throw up and so we come into this construction zone I pull the van over because you're driving on the left side of the road and I jump out of the van and I fall on my hands and knees next to the guardrail and I'm barfing my guts out and the thing is, it's a construction zone. All the cars are just parked. And they're looking at me. And I feel like I'm a dog. You know, oh, those Americans can't handle their points, you know. <laughs> and I can't, I can't fix it. It's so humbling. And my wife couldn't drive, couldn't even take me home because she didn't know how to drive with the manual, you know, with the left hand. So we had to find somebody, a friend of ours, and get them to come. And, and so we're stuck there for like 45 minutes. Most humbling time. It was a storm that I couldn't get out of. Lord, where are you? And all I could pray is, God, have mercy on me. God, have mercy on me. I mean, my mind is spinning. You can't think clearly during those times. But I know, looking back, the Lord was with me. Even though it was an infirmity I couldn't help, it was my storm. And I cried out in fear. And I like what happened here in verse 27. Immediately, at a time of utmost terror, the Lord spoke to them. He must have been close because they heard him. And he said, be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. Do you know there's five times in the New Testament where Jesus says, be of good cheer? And we need to take heed to that. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 2, Then behold, they brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, be of good cheer, your sins are forgiven you. We need to be of good cheer because he forgives our sins. 
Matthew 9, 22, but Jesus turning around when he saw her, he said, be of good cheer, daughter, your faith has made you well. And the woman was made well from that hour. The third instance is right here in Matthew 14. And then in John 16, verse 33, Jesus with his disciples there in the upper room, these things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. And then the last one is in Acts 23, 11, where Jesus is ministering to Paul while Paul's in prison in Caesarea. And he, Jesus says to him clearly, but the following night the Lord stood by him and said, be of good cheer, Paul, for as you have testified for me in Jerusalem, you must also bear witness at Rome. It's during those times of fear, the Lord wants to speak to us and say, be of good cheer. It's me. Don't be afraid. The hope in the midst of storm is Jesus being with you. But what if he's not present with me? What if I don't feel his presence? He's still there because he sees us in our storm. We want the storm to quit before we have the storm settled in our heart. But Jesus speaking this world word is saying this, let me calm the storm in your heart before I calm the storm outside. Are we willing to let the Lord do it his way? To calm the storm that's happening right now in your heart, in your mind, the anxiety the fear, the what-ifs, all the storm. It's a, it's a lightning storm. The Lord wants to calm your storm, and he'll take care of the outward in his time. Because when he spoke that, the storm was still going on and didn't stop. We have to believe his ability to do what he said in order to experience the reality of of those words, do not be afraid. Okay, verse 28. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So he said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, O you of little faith, why did you doubt? Matthew's gospel is the only one that includes this account of Peter getting out of the boat. All the disciples saw Jesus. And it was like the high pro glow, you know, it was, it was like, uh, you know, who is this? But they recognized the voice. And then so Peter said, Lord, if it's you, then you bid me to come out on the boat to you. Notice he said to you, not just, hey, I'm going to try that. that. That looks cool. You know, it wasn't a showboat thing. It was, I, I want to go to Jesus. I want to be where he is. I want to be with him. And he climbed out of the boat. And the rest of the guys are like, what, are you kidding? I mean, you can just, you can hear what they had to say in Aramaic, of course. So Peter gets out of the boat, as the scripture says, and he walks on the water to come to Jesus. But he got his eyes off of Jesus and onto the wind. And he was afraid and he began to sink. But notice the last phrase of verse 30. He cried out saying, Lord, save me. He didn't try to swim back to the boat. Notice that? When we're in the midst of a storm and we get this step of faith in our life and we think, okay, I got this, I got this. And all of a sudden we feel like like the King Super ad, so low, you know, we start going down. (laughs) Uh, Don't try to swim back and figure it out just call out to Jesus like Peter did. 
And it says immediately. So how close was Jesus to Peter? Actually, Jesus, Jesus was right there. And Peter was walking in the water and he was almost there. And then it's like, oh my gosh, it's all happening. Cries out to the Lord. Immediately, the Lord grabs him. Why didn't Peter sink after the Lord grabbed him? Because, because Jesus was on control of the elements. He was walking on the water. They're not in the boat yet. And Peter said, come. I mean, excuse me, the Lord said to Peter, come. And he, he, didn't, he said that not to mock him or to make fun of him. But he said, yes, use that faith. And then Peter was, realized that um, he wasn't such a big man of faith after all. And he started sinking, humbled again. And Jesus in verse 31 says, oh, you have little faith. And you need to understand, he's not putting Peter down. He's speaking the truth about, Peter, you need to understand you're weak. You're weak without me. Why did you doubt? We could do this. And then, I love verse 32, when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Who's they? Jesus and Peter. How did Peter get in the boat? He couldn't stand on anything. Jesus carried him and brought him into the safety of the boat, supposed safety. And immediately when Jesus and Peter got in the boat, then the storm stopped. And not before. Jesus wants to carry you in the midst of your storm. But you got to let him. you got to call out to him. Some of you are in just, just incredible storms. I read the prayer requests that come through from Grace FM. And, and it's just uh, the health issues, the relationship issues, the financial issues, the desperation uh, of the prayer requests just are so intense and heartbreaking. And some of them have been in that for a long time. Maybe some of you have been in your storm for a long, long time. And you're tired of rowing. Where's Jesus? Well, here's what he wants to say to you in the fourth watch of the night. Be of good cheer. It's me. Don't be afraid. And by him saying it's me, you can say I am. Because that's who he is. He wants to calm the storm in your heart first before he calms the storm outwardly. Will you let him do that? That's a step of faith on your part because so often you want to just figure it out. And that's what he's calling you to do right now is instead of trying to figure it out, just call out to him, let him sort it out. We're so fearful of stepping out of the boat to Jesus because the boat can be kind of a place of comfort, safety, and security. And, and maybe the Lord has been speaking to your heart that you need to step out in faith in some areas of your life, and you're just afraid. You're afraid it won't work. I mean, look at all the failures. Look at how many times I was wrong. And, and that's all you see yourself through is your failures. Don't allow your failures to block your future momentum in Jesus because he's there with you. He wants to do a new thing. You're a new creation. Let him do a new thing. Let him use all the failures as part of life lessons. I mean, I'm almost 71, and I don't want to. I don't want to make any more mistakes. You know, I've made enough for like three lifetimes. I don't want to make any more mistakes. I just want to finish well. I just want to get to the end and hear, "Well done, good and faithful servant." Right? I like how Mark includes this in his account of this in Mark 6, verse 51 to 52. It says, Then he got into the boat with them, and the wind stopped, and they were utterly astonished. That's kind of the fancy way of saying their minds were blown. Now get this. They were astonished that the wind stopped. What? What? For they had not gained any insight from the incident of the loaves. But their heart was hardened. 
Have you ever prayed for your relative or your kids or something and say, God, just do a miracle on their life. You know, just have a lightning bolt strike real close and just shake them up. Well, guess what? Miracles don't necessarily lead to saving faith. Because if the heart is hard, then it's just going to bounce off and not penetrate. I mean, look at how much we fought against the Lord before we surrendered. It's still true today. The Lord is looking to amaze us. He's looking to refresh and renew that sense of mystery and majesty on who he is. But we get so wrapped up in figuring it out and having it all calculated and all sorted because we're all in control. Ask God to amaze you this week. Ask God to open your eyes to see him working in a way that you just know it's him. Have him renew that sense of mystery and wonder again because he's so much bigger than we can ever comprehend. And he can work in the midst of our storms, can't he? I know he can. We're going to close with a word of prayer and then we're going to have communion together. I'm going to share with the communion cup. So join with me in prayer as we close. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for these scriptures and for what took place here. And we thank you that you know what is going on in our life. Grant to us, Lord, the gift of faith to trust you in the midst of our storm. And may you settle the storm in our hearts even before you settle the storm outwardly. May we trust you with all of our heart and not lean on our own understanding. And so God, work with us now through the time of of the breaking of the bread and the sharing of the cup. And as we worship together, Lord, let this be a time between us and you personally. In Jesus' name, amen. We pray that you've been encouraged by this Bible study delivered live from the sanctuary of Calvary Aurora. For prayer or a copy of this study, call us at 877-30-GRACE. That's 877-304-7223. Or visit us online at calvaryaurora.org. Be blessed as you worship Jesus this week.